Hello, my name is Miss Anne, and today we have an exciting story about two of the kings of Judah. But first we're going to sing a song about faith is just believing, and we're going to see how uh, one of the kings had to really have faith and trust in what God said he would do. Our memory verse is Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 34, 4. Let's say it together. Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. I sought the Lord means uh, to seek, and he's the man, um, it's King David, and King David is saying he was seeking the Lord, and the Lord answered him, and the Lord delivered him from his fears. Let's say it one more time. Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. I sought the Lord means, as I said, to seek and to pray to God and tell him what is on your mind. If you are his child, you can be sure he will answer you and deliver you from your fear. He may not answer you in the way that you thought the prayer would be answered, but he will and his way is always best. And you know you do not need to fear because he is in control. While David was fighting the enemies of Israel at the time of King Saul, he fought and defeated many of the groups around the country of Israel. Later he became king and he continued to defeat other enemies of Israel, the country Israel. And this was the combined Israel, which was what later became both Israel and Judah. But the combined kingdoms under King David and then under King Solomon uh, was the high point of the kingdom. After the kingdoms split with Solomon's son, uh, the two strength of the two countries was less and less as they both countries turned away from God. Throughout the years, there were many kings, a number of kings, both in Israel and in Judah. Uh, but there were no kings in Israel who led the people back to worshiping God, but there were a few kings in Judah who did. We are going to look at two of the later kings of Judah, First, uh, a bad king, and then a good king. Looking at the chart of the kings and of uh, both Judah and Israel, you can see that King Ahaz is by the name, a uh, bigger name, of uh, Micah, who was a prophet. This is in the second column between 750 and 700 B.C. Today we will start with King Ahaz. He began to rule about 740 B.C. Remember, B.C. means before Christ. It is a countdown to zero, to Christ's birth. Second Chronicles 28, verses 1 through 5, we read, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Remember, I said there were no righteous kings in Israel. And they used that comment very in the, as in the way of his father, David. And in, by this time, of course, it's his great, 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 at least, or maybe four great grandfather. But they referred to any male ancestor as father. Continuing in verse 2, he made, even made metal images for the Baal, which was the idol. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. These were all places where idols were worshipped. Verse 5 says, Therefore the Lord his God gave him into the hand of the king of Syria, who defeated him and took captive a great number of his people and brought them to Damascus. 
that was the capital city of Syria. And we have two countries in our lesson that we're talking about. Syria was the foremost country at the first of the story, and by later on in the story, it's then the Assyrians, and the Assyrians lived farther uh, to the north and east of the lands of Judah and Israel. King Ahaz made his choice to disobey God, and many people suffered for that decision. God permitted the Syrians to kill many people in the country of Judah and took many more captives and made them work as slaves in their country. Verse 6 tells us that Pekah of Syria killed 120,000 from Judah in one day, all of the men of valor or strength, because they had forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers. That left 120 families without the husband or the father who basically did the work that supported the family. One person's bad choice to walk away from God's way can affect many other people. It was a terrible loss to the small country. The king tried to get other countries to help him, and he gave lots of money to the king of Assyria, which was still not a major power at this time. But the king refused to help him and kept the money. Instead of turning to the Lord, King Ahaz cut up the, special, the things of special metals in the house of the Lord and then closed the house of the Lord or the temple. King Ahaz kept doing more terrible things. Verse 19 tells us why all this trouble came to Judah. For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Judah, for he had made Judah act sinfully and had been very unfaithful to the Lord. There are consequences when we do not obey the Lord. We do not have God's blessing, and he allows trouble to come to us so that we will turn back to God. Verse, 20 says, verse 27 tells us, And Ahaz slept with his fathers, or he died, and they buried him in Jerusalem, but not in the area of the kings. Not burying him with the kings, other kings, showed that they did not respect King Ahaz and did not think he was worthy of the honor of being buried where King David was buried. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. After the disastrous results of King Ahaz, I'm sure the people of the land wondered what was going to happen. Families had lost sons in wars, and daughters and sons and brothers and sisters had been taken captive and worked as slaves in other countries. They had lost most of the animals and other things of value. They'd either been taken or destroyed. And they had no idea what this new king would do. I'm sure many people stood around on the corners of the street talking about what would happen with this new king. Would he be like his father Ahaz? In 2 Chronicles 29, verses 1, 2, and 2, we have the answer to that question. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. Hezekiah was a good king because he chose to do what the Lord wanted him to do. King Hezekiah had seen what happened to Judah in the years that his father Ahaz was king. He would have been about nine years old when his grandfather, King Jotham, died. Second Chronicles 27, 2 tells us about King Jotham, that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So Hezekiah had seen a good king reigning. Verse 3 in Second Chronicles 29 tells us about Hezekiah. In the very first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He called the Levites and priests together. Now the Levites and the priests were the ones in charge of the temple. They were the ones to offer the sacrifices, keep the, uh, the temple clean, and provide for everything that needed to be done. And he told them in verse 5, Hear me, Levites, now consecrate yourself and consecrate the house of the Lord and the God of your fathers and carry out the filth or dirt from the holy place. Consecrate means to dedicate or set something aside for special use. Immediately, Hezekiah works to get God's house or the temple of God open for worship. He must have been planning to do this long before he actually became king. In the last part of verse 5, Hezekiah reminds them then in verse 6 and 7, our fathers have been unfaithful 
and done what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and turned their backs. They have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. All these offerings to God were to be made in the temple and nowhere else. All other altars and places to burn incense were for idols. Hezekiah says in verse 10, Now it is in my heart to make a covenant or a contract with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may turn away from us. Verses 15 through 17 tells us that the priests and Levites cleaned the house of the Lord, repaired the building, took all the things out of the building that didn't belong there, and began to consecrate the temple. In 16 days, still in the first month, they had finished the consecration. Verse 18 tells us, Then they went to Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar, all its utensils, the table for showbread. Then Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the officials of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. And when they started offering sacrifices, King Hezekiah had the music started. Verse 28 tells us the whole assembly, or all the people, worshipped. The singers sang and the trumpeters trumpeted. And all of this continued until the burnt offerings were finished. When the offering was finished, the king and all who were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. Thus the service of the house of the Lord was restored. By offering sacrifices to the Lord God, they showed that they were looking forward to the Messiah, the promised one. God loved them very much and had promised that one day he would send the Messiah who would pay for their sins. And not only theirs, but the sins of everyone. Now we know that one was Jesus, God's Son, who came to earth, was born as a baby, and he lived a perfect life. Then he died on the cross to pay for my sins, your sins, and the sins of everyone who has ever lived on the earth. He rose from the dead on the third day to prove that he was God and that he had truly paid for the punishment for our sin. That means you and me as well as everybody who has ever lived. To have forgiveness of sin, all you have to do is believe that Jesus is God's Son, ask Him to forgive you, and ask Him to come in and guide your life. He promises to forgive your sin and give you a clean heart. He will send His Holy Spirit to be with you always, to guide you and direct you. Then you know you will go to heaven to be with Jesus someday. How wonderful that promise is for all of us. Next, King Hezekiah extended an invitation to the northern and southern kingdoms to come and celebrate the Passover. That was the very special celebration, reminding them how God had brought their ancestors out of the country of Egypt and returned them to the land of Israel that they had. Second Chronicles 30.10 tells us that the people in the northern kingdom, that was Israel, laughed them, the, mock, the messengers, laughed them to scorn and mocked them. But a few did want to worship God and some did come. Verse 14 tells us that after the people celebrated the Passover, they set to work to remove the altars that were in Jerusalem and all the altars for burning incense they took away and threw in the Kedron Valley. All these were for places and all these things were for worship of idols. They also tore down the idols and the bronze snake that Moses had made because the people were worshiping it as an idol. The people joined together and removed the idols from the land of Judah. They started again to follow God's plan for support of the temple um, and to supply what was needed for uh, the priests and their families and for the offerings they, with the needed food and supplies. This was called the tithe or a tenth of whatever they had in crops or what they had earned. Now in the fourth year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Shalmazer of Assyria invaded the northern king of Israel. Not Judah, he invaded Israel, the ten northern tribes. God had warned these Jews that unless they stopped worshiping idols and obeyed him, they would become slaves of the Assyrians. The Assyrians lay siege 
to Samaria. That was the capital city. That means they surrounded it with their army and no one could get in and out. And eventually they ran out of food and water. And two years later, they captured the city. The people were led back to Assyria as captives, just as God had warned. But in Judah, in verse 20 of Second Chronicles 31, it tells us, And thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah. He did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God. Hezekiah continued to follow the Lord. Ten years later, the Assyrians returned to the area this time to invade the kingdom of Judah, ruled by Hezekiah. City after city fell to the powerful Assyrian army. Verse 2 of chapter 32 tells us, Hezekiah planned with his officers and his mighty men to stop the water of the springs that were outside the city, and they helped him. They stopped the water so the Assyrians, when they arrived, would not have an easy supply of water. But this picture shows the actual tunnel that King Hezekiah had dug to divert the water into the city of Jerusalem those many years ago. If you go to Jerusalem today, you can see that tunnel. It still exists. King Hezekiah set, set to work to build up the walls that were broken down, to raise the towers, and then he built another wall on the outside of the city. He appointed military officers and uh, made weapons and shields in abundance, and he spoke words of encouragement to the people. Chapter 32, verse 7, Hezekiah said, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the hordes, or many people, that are with him, for there, is, there are more with us than with him. For with him is the arm of flesh, or men, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people took confidence in the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Hezekiah that knew that the help from the Lord God was more than all the men of the world together. It is same for us. God is more powerful than any group or any evil being. The king of Assyria demanded a payment of 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. That's a lot. King Hezekiah gave him all the silver and gold in the treasuries of the royal palace and the temple. The Assyrian king Sennacherib took the money but did not leave. Rabbishek, the, top, the chief commander took, of the army, took completely surrounded Jerusalem. That put that city into siege where no one could come in or out. Rabshakeh stood and cried out with a loud voice to the people of Jerusalem. We can read his word in verses 10 through 14 of chapter 32. Rabshakeh shouted, On what are you trusting that you endure the siege of Jerusalem? Is not Hezekiah misleading you that he may give you over to die by famine when you have no food and by thirst when he tells you, The Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria. Don't you know what I and my fathers have done to all the people of other lands? Rabshakeh gave a long speech saying the gods of the other countries couldn't deliver those people and your God also can't deliver you from my hand. He was saying that he was stronger than Almighty God. Of course, that was not true. The God of Israel was the God of creation who made everything that exists. It is a serious thing to say that the Lord God is nothing. Then Rabshakeh said other dreadful things against the true God and Hezekiah. He also sent a letter to the palace. But the people on the wall said nothing back to Rabshakeh, just as King Hezekiah had told them to do. Would God really be able to protect them? What do you do when you're in trouble? Do you sit there and worry and stew? What do you do? Well, we know what Hezekiah did. Hezekiah went into the temple, the house of the Lord, took the letter and spread it out before the Lord and said, O oh Lord, you have made heaven and earth. You are the God, even you alone. Now therefore, O oh God, Lord our God, I beg you, you save us out of his hand and that all of the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, even you only. 
The first time, this is the first time, and the servants of the enemy had king had come without him. The prophet Isaiah told Hezekiah, Do not be afraid because of the words you have heard. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he will return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. And so it happened. Rabshakeh heard that the Egyptians were marching against him, so his army left Jerusalem and returned to their own land. A year or so later, the enemy king Sennacherib came in person with his army and lay siege to Jerusalem. He also yelled at the people and told them their God could not help them against his powerful army. Again, King Hezekiah went to the temple and prayed to God. Then Isaiah the prophet sent a message to the king in 2 Kings 19.32. The Lord is speaking and says, I have heard your prayer, said the Lord. The enemy king shall not come into the city or shoot an arrow there, but he will return the way he came, said the Lord. I will defend the city to save it for my own sake. <clears throat> That's Isaiah 37, 3. Notice the Lord said he will defend Jerusalem for his own sake. God also said that Sennacherib would die in his own country. Could anyone believe a promise like that? Would God really protect them? King Hezekiah and Isaiah believed it. They didn't know how God would do it, but they believed and they could trust in the Lord. And we can believe God's promises too, even when we are in great change, danger. Remember our memory verse, Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. We don't know how the Lord will answer us, but we do know that he is in control, so we do not need to fear. Verse 35 tells us, That night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of Assyrians. And when the people rose in the morning, they behold, these were all dead bodies. Then the king of Assyria went back home and lived at Nineveh. That was the capital of Assyria. The Lord had kept his promise. Not one arrow was shot into the city. Later, while King Sennacherib was worshiping in the temple of his God, his sons killed him, just like the Lord said would happen. But good King Hezekiah ruled for 29 years, serving the Lord and obeying him. Trouble comes into all of our lives. If you have trusted Jesus as your Savior, then you don't have to worry. When trouble does come to your life, you can be sure of God's care and provision. Three things can happen when there is trouble. First of all, God will keep us from it. He'll keep us out of it. Two, God will take us through it. Or three, God will take us out of it into heaven. Whatever God's plan is for your life, you know he will be with you always. He has given you his Holy Spirit to live with each one of us, as Jesus promised in Matthew 28, 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. If you have never asked Jesus to forgive your sin, you can do so with me when I pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the story in the, your word that tells us that you will honor those and you care for us. And if we have asked you to be our Savior, you will guide us in our life. If anyone listening has not, I pray, Lord, that they will pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I have sinned and done wrong things. I know that Jesus is God's Son. I ask you to forgive me for my sin, and I ask you to come into my life and guide me. Thank you that you love me, and thank you that you have promised to be with me. Lord, we thank you. For this lesson, and may all of us remember, Lord, that you are faithful, and we do not need to fear because you are in control, and you will walk with us through the difficulties of life, or keep us from them, or take us home to be with you in heaven. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Goodbye. See you next time.